Welcome once again, and let's officially start. <laughs> Can you please tell us what is trauma and what are some of the signs and symptoms? How would one recognize it? So I'm going to give you the SAMHSA definition of trauma. SAMHSA is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration. Um, as becoming a clinical mental health counselor, this is an affiliation that we um, pay attention to very closely. They are highly regarded in the area of trauma and trauma-informed care. So their definition is trauma is a widespread, harmful, and costly public health problem. It occurs as a result of violence, abuse, neglect, loss, disaster, war, and other emotionally harmful experiences. Trauma has no boundaries with regard to age, gender, socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, geography, or sexual orientation. It is an almost universal experience of people with mental and substance use disorders. The need to address trauma is increasingly viewed as an important component of effective behavioral health service delivery. Additionally, it has become evident that addressing trauma requires a multi-pronged, multi-agency public health approach, inclusive of public education and awareness, prevention and early identification, and effective trauma-specific assessment and treatment. So that's a mouthful. Yeah. Um, it's a really fancy way of saying that, um, you know, suffering is a universal human experience, you know, basic Buddhist principle. Um, most people do endure trauma to some extent. And um, we really need to combat trauma in a multidisciplinary way. There's no really one way or right way. Not everything works for everybody. But I will say from the clinical standpoint, outside of being a yoga teacher and understanding the energetics of what you know yoga um, and Ayurveda do for people, um, clinically speaking, we really need evidentiary supported practices. And we know that you know therapy, is invaluable. Um, and we also know that community care, having intervention resources and support is undeniably really your best tools. It's very hard to come out of trauma alone. That isolation is what really digs everything deeper. That's why there's uh, group therapy is so huge on top of individual therapy or family therapy. So it's really a dynamic approach that's necessary. Um, some of the signs of trauma, you know, it can be very subtle. Some people actually um, use this, their sense of humor. You might see someone who was not really a social person become almost excessively social. You might see a very extroverted person become deeply introverted and withdraw. Um, you know, suicidal ideation. Um, and that could be anything from getting rid of prized possessions or just um, saying things to people kind of subtly like, well, if I weren't here, and if you're not adept at understanding that there might be something more to that under the surface, um, you might miss it, you know? Um, it could be a lot of times people become very um, sexually active, uh, at a, at especially at a young age. You'll see a lot of um, post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. Mm -hmm. So people are talking very fast, talking very loud, kind of like very frantic, can't calm down. Um, and then you can see a lot of under-functioning and over-functioning. So it's, the amazing thing is, is how different people can respond. You know, the trauma response is not always so specific. Mm -hmm. so over-functioning would look like um, someone taking on the world. They're doing a million things at once. They can't sit still. And then under-functioning might be somebody who can't get out of bed and go to work. Yeah, you know, wow. They just can't function. Um, okay. So it's tricky. It's very tricky because it's not always noticeable. Mm -hmm. And okay. um, as far as um, as far as targeting it, 
uh, for people who think, well, how would I know? Mm -hmm. I think that if oh, there's a red flag, whether it's family dynamic or a friendship, um, or you're just, your intuition's kicking in and you're thinking something isn't right here, um, there's hotlines for everything. There's, mm -hmm. you can go and Google community support for trauma, you know, trauma resources in your county, in your state, and you'll get a host of things that pop up, make a phone call and get that person help. Oftentimes we're afraid we're gonna lose the friendship or lose the partnership. But at the mm -hmm. end of the day, um, their anger and disappointment is part of the trauma healing and they will get over it. Your job is to get the person help um, and not worry so much about how they're gonna respond to it, especially if you think it's a life and death situation. Mm -hmm. Wow, very interesting. So I guess you actually answered my next question. Um, what causes trauma? So, oh gosh, it re you know, and here's the other thing about trauma is that I, you and I could go through the same experience, but mm -hmm. I might handle it completely differently. Whether mm -hmm. my nervous system is just a little bit stronger in the moment, mm -hmm. or we just have different dispositions, constitutionally mm -hmm. speaking. Mm -hmm. Um, so causes of trauma a lot of times are abuse. Um, neglect, you know, a child being very neglected. So no access to food or, you know, they're wearing the same clothing every day. They have holes in their shoes. So there's a lot of, you know, embarrassment, feelings of unworthiness. Um, substance abuse is huge. You see substance abuse and trauma going hand in hand. Um, it could be a car accident, a natural disaster. And wow. the thing I think people forget is you don't actually have to be in the trauma. I like to use 9-11 in America as a example of that. All you saw over and over on the news were these planes crashing into the buildings. So that's mm -hmm. secondary and tertiary trauma. You know, the primary trauma was the people that were there witnessing it. And yes. then, well, really in it. And then the secondary is witnessing it. And then us watching it on TV, I would consider to be more tertiary, but that's very traumatic. I mean, people really couldn't come up from that, just watching it on TV, understanding what was happening and trying to process it. So any natural disaster like the tsunamis um, in Sri Lanka was a horrible global disaster. And even though we're not there, that global trauma really does affect us, um, all of us. We're, we're processing that in various ways. And then there's also generational trauma. And so an example of that would be, um, you know, all of the women in my family, most of them were in abusive relationships and a lot of the husbands were drinkers. Wow. And so uh, we all kind of were fulfilling that cycle. Um, and until you have the awareness and the tools to understand that this is gen generational trauma and I, I have a choice, you know, choice is empowerment. I have a choice. I can, I can choose different. Mm -hmm. Um, and for me, I didn't understand that until I left, I, I had the courage and the strength to leave. And then I did the work of understanding that I was repeating these cycles, that there was a name for it and that I had choices and that I could heal, you know, myself so mm -hmm. that better opportunities would open. Cause we tend to attract the same person in those situations. It could even be a friendship. And mm -hmm. you're like, why am I always attracting the friends that are taking from me, mm -hmm. and, you know, abusing me or walking all over me. And really that's part of the healing. Um, and then when you work on that internally, externally, new, new opportunity, new people show up. And so, you know, the work is working, you know, people say, how do I know it's working? It, it could take years. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Um, trauma is very hard to overcome. It's not an overnight process. It takes a lot of nurturance and a lot of nourishment. And I love the term self-care and I loathe the term self-care because I think self-care has become very superficial. I love community care. Mm -hmm. um, I've never seen a person come out of trauma without getting involved in the community. 
-hmm. And a lot of time that looks like volunteering. So they say, when in need, do a good deed, right? Mm -hmm. I'm hurting and I need to help that hurt. So I'm going to reach out and I'm going to help other people. And that's so deeply soulfully healing, even though they might not be seeing it. Um, that subtle change in thinking, getting out of your own way, um, taking your mess, making it your message that mm -hmm. starts to happen over time. Um, and that's really part of the therapeutic process as well is that community care, whether it's group therapy or volunteering or going to a, an AA meeting or an NA meeting, um, smart recovery, you know, the, the tools are endless and all of these organization organizations that I'm kind of spewing, I know very quickly, but they're international, they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, and now being so, uh, tied to our computers with the pandemic, you know, it's even more accessible because you can just hop online and, and you can access all of these community resources with a click of a button, you know, yeah. telemedic health is very big now. So um, it's almost more accessible in, in a way. Okay. So um, I'll actually come back. I've actually got a question from what you just mentioned, sure. but I'll write it down. Um, what, can you tell me, can trauma be cured? It can. I don't like the word cure because I feel like then the person that is in, in deep trauma um, has so much pressure on themselves to quote unquote cure it. Um, drama, by the way, you know, people say, oh, that person is just, oh, they're always so dramatic. And I always say drama's unhealed trauma. People who are tend to be very dramatic in that type of way that's noticeable and uncomfortable for people that are witnessing it, there's usually a lot of deep, deep trauma under that. So it can be cured. It takes time. It's not a one size fits all, especially if the trauma is deep. Um, my work is lifetime and I'm committed to that and I accept it. So I think a lot of compassion and self-acceptance comes into play here. Um, and that's where mindfulness comes in. You know, mindfulness has been proven to, and yoga have been proven to be amazingly powerful mm -hmm. tools for trauma healing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really a testament to that. And, and my clients are a testament to that. So there is a way out, but, mm -hmm. and no one likes hearing this. And I know mm -hmm. you're very um, adept at this kind mm -hmm. of mantra. The only mm -hmm. way out is in. Yeah. Um, and if you keep going for the escape and you keep trying to run from yourself, you're mm -hmm. going to, you're going to live a life of exhaustion. You're going to yeah. feel very beat up and you're going to mm -hmm. feel very isolated and alone. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that's not the answer a lot of people like to hear, but when you start diving in a little bit deeper um, and cultivating that self-awareness um, and bringing lots of compassion to that practice, you will find something on the other side and it, and it might be slow going, but I always say like slow and steady wins the race. And this is definitely not a race that you want to be running a marathon because trauma work is, ex it's, it's very emotionally taxing. Mm -hmm. It's mentally and emotionally taxing. And then I would also encourage people. Um, I see a lot of people give up when they get in the hands of the wrong person mm -hmm. and like anything else, you know, finding a lawyer to um, fight for something on your behalf in court, finding that right doctor for you. It's the same thing with anything therapeutically, even a yoga teacher. You have to find the right fit and that can take time. So I encourage people not to give up on that because just because somebody has a five-star rating of being one of the best trauma therapists out there, they might not resonate with you. And it doesn't mean that you're failing. It just means they're not right for you. And you just have to do a little bit more legwork and find someone who's a better fit for you. And you'll always know because your body knows, Yeah, you know, yeah. you just have to learn to trust and listen to your body. Mm -hmm. um, pay attention. You know, if you're tightening up and you're angry and you're, um, almost going into a fight or flight response, working with a practitioner, <laughs> they're not for you. And that's okay. They're not for you. You want to yeah. feel very relaxed and safe. Yeah, very we all are in it. Yeah, we all are energy beings. So basically we can actually feed off each other's energies. Yeah. So, yeah. 
And unfortunately, mm -hmm. what happens with trauma is you stop trusting yourself and mm -hmm. you're out of your body. It's a very mm -hmm. out of body experience. We're not connected. Um, and, you know, so the goal of deep trauma work is to get us back into the body and okay. back to that connection. And then you will certainly reconnect with your intuition and learn to trust yourself. Because a lot of times when we're in fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, which is the trauma mm -hmm. response, right? Stuck in our limbic system. So the back of the brain, that primal reptilian brain, mm -hmm. um, how can you be connected when you're in survival mode? I mean, and we're all, we all experience this. We're in a global pandemic. Many mm -hmm. people are like, I've never felt this way before. They're probably people who've never really had that solid experience. Good for them. Of, uh, of, of a trauma response. And a lot of people, this is very traumatic. Yes. You know, we're seeing suicide rates skyrocket, domestic violence, child mm -hmm. abuse, substance abuse. Mm -hmm. We're seeing numbers we've never seen before because we're being forced into isolation. There's yes. heightened disconnection. Uh, from a mental health standpoint, I'm not a big fan of social distancing. I think the term should be physical distancing. No okay. one needs so no one needs to socially distance right now. We mm -hmm. need to be um, strategizing how we're going to stay connected socially because it's a life, it's life support. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's really, it's really our lifeline. And a lot of people are basically saying that old wounds are actually reopening, and yeah. uh, basically old emotions are coming back because of being isolated. Some people, like you men mentioned, um, they in in relationships where there's violence amongst um, between two people that are supposedly um, supposed to be loving each other, but they're yeah. not. And so what if, um, oh no, okay, let's go back to that. Does trauma re resurface in situations like this? Because I mean, old, old wounds Absolutely. actually come in. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, for m many people, not mm -hmm. all, we've had a lot of time to think. Mm -hmm. And what happens there is you start to, you're triggered, something triggers you mm -hmm. and a memory comes or you're thinking about things you never thought before because you're, you know, we all become very adept at staying busy. And mm -hmm. especially in America, we're a very young culture, you know, produce, produce, go, go, do, do, mm -hmm. um, work, work. And so you're always sidestepping any type of pain or suffering and never really being able to dive deep into it. So there were a lot of people saying to me, I'm thinking about things that I haven't thought about since I've been a kid, or I okay. remember this thing that happened with my, you know, mother, and mm -hmm. I don't know where it's coming from. Um, when there's something as large scale as this globally, it's very common for you to be personally and individually triggered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's actually quite interesting because sometimes we actually take a lot of things for granted, you know? Um, we do, and we're multifaceted beings. And I think that there's been a heightened consciousness and awakening happening during mm -hmm. this, maybe more um, exposed for some people. Like, oh, mm -hmm. I, I know, you know, people really noticing a lot and maybe more subtle for other people. But mm -hmm. nine out of 10 times when I'm talking to someone, they're very aware that this has been, um, this global pandemic has been a catalyst for deep um, healing work, not necessarily trauma, but just deep healing work personally. And that's actually a good thing because mm -hmm. the more the collective does heal, um, especially the generational trauma wounds, the, the better it is for, you know, my children and my children's children and all of the next generations to come. Yeah. So although it's hard work, it's valuable work um, and it's sacred work. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually better to actually heal generations instead of generations taking uh, baggage with them along the way. Absolutely. Yeah. So what advice would you give to somebody that does not have access to resources? Because not, have, not everyone have access to a phone. It could be simple yeah. for some. And I mean, you could, um, like you mentioned that all of the, the contact details are on the internet. They can just uh, up on the internet and get the contact details and call, call the hotlines and things like that. But not everyone has access. So what advice would you give to somebody like that? 
Not everyone has access. Um, you, I think a lot of people are afraid to speak out um, because of judgment or um, other reasons. It could be, I'm, I, I don't want to be, me you know, they're going to medicate me. They're going to tell me I'm crazy or, you know, I, I've heard all of these things. People give someone in your life that you trust implicitly and someone who is safe for you a chance to listen. I think most people would be surprised that mm -hmm. help is right in front of them and they just can't see it. So if okay. you don't have access to the internet, there usually there's someone within your circle that mm -hmm. you can say, I need, I need someone to talk to. Mm -hmm. um, or they know someone with a phone to say, can I borrow your phone? I, I, I need to look something up. Um, that's, you know, this is, this is an emergency situation and I need to, to look something up and they can get themselves, you know, a phone number. Um, mm -hmm. and, and this is not, I understand that not everybody has insurance or the ability to see a licensed counselor or therapist, mm -hmm. but I can't stress enough that the amount of free, re the, the, one of the gifts of the pandemic, in my humble opinion, is that there are so many more free resources now. Yes. Um, so you'll be surprised at every turn of the corner in neighborhoods, there's something there, food pantries. So if someone doesn't have, um, you know, the ability to, or the money for food, um, food pantries, phoning a friend, going to a trusted family member, um, getting that one phone number, usually it takes just one phone call mm -hmm. and, and it's very specific to the trauma. So if it's mental health, you would call that number. If it's a food pantry, there's that. But also if they didn't feel like they could trust a family member or friend, which is also very common, go to a religious or non-religious organization in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't necessarily need to be like, I have a lot of non-denominational churches around mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. um, or some kind of um, spiritual affiliation or some kind of group that you know that exists in the community. Um, it just takes that one initial conversation. And I have found that once somebody gets over the hump of that initial conversation, they, the relief that they feel inside, you hear that a lot from um, young people going through suicidal ideation. Mm -hmm. We're trained to actually ask, I'm trained in QPR. Mm -hmm. And so in that training, I am to ask the person outright, are you thinking of taking your life? Do you want to kill yourself? That we used to not ever be able to ask that because wow. the idea was you're going to put it in their head. The mm -hmm. minute you ask that question, that person actually feels relief. Oh, I can, I, I can unburden myself now. This person's in my head. They, mm -hmm. they, they're thinking it's there and you ask the question and then they get to answer and you'll be surprised. The, the act, there's actually statistics. I don't have them on me right now, mm -hmm. but the statistics are higher than you would think of people that say, yes, I am. I'm thinking of taking my life. Wow. It's and actually quite common. Said, yeah, yes. it, 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 it seems counterintuitive, but mm -hmm. we've actually found over the last few years that this has been way more functional by being mm -hmm. extremely direct and forthcoming. And then clearly, um, so think about it this way. So I'm counseling you, right? You're, mm -hmm. You have suicidal ideation. I don't ask you, so I don't know. I'm thinking it in my head, but I don't know. You walk away from me. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what, and I don't want that on my head if something mm -hmm. happened to you and I don't know what you're going to do, but now I've asked you. So even if you start to be wishy-washy and waver in your answer, I'm not leaving your side. Yeah. I'm going to make a phone call and I'm going to get you help right there in that moment. So the uh, statistics of saving a life by asking the direct question has actually been um, way more productive and mm -hmm. helpful. Yeah. Uh with, with the, my experience, I actually noticed that women are more open to talking about their feelings. Even if they're yes. going through something traumatic, they're more open to, uh, to talk about it. But yes. men in general, they basically, they're too scared to open up because I guess we live in a society, they were actually uh, conditioned to think that it's weak if they actually open up and tell, tell a person how they're feeling. 
Yeah. Do you have, um, uh, although I actually created a group only for women, but that's for the yoga sessions. Mm -hmm. This platform is actually for both men and women. And I would, I would actually, um, I would really appreciate you actually giving the men advice as well and telling them that um, it's not weak to actually open up and ask yeah. for help, you know? So for all our men out there, um, we do a lot of work with, within the domestic violence arena and suicide for my full-time job. And mm -hmm. men have the highest rate of suicide, actually white males between wow. a specific age. Again, I don't have that off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. And um, it is because they feel weak and they feel that they can't reach out. And then mm -hmm. there are a lot of men who are abused by their partner. And mm -hmm. oftentimes, unfortunately, we think that it's a woman being abused by a man. And yeah. I was actually in court one day for a, um, for a um, harassment dispute. And mm -hmm. this boy, young boy, like 17 years old, was there with his family. And thank goodness he had uh, the, uh, such a supportive family. He mm -hmm. was being beaten by his girlfriend. Wow. And he was there to get a restraining order. And in a courtroom full of all women pursuing restraining orders, he was the only guy. And I walked up to him and gave him the biggest hug. And I wow. commended his mother and father. And I said, I am so proud of you that you were brave enough to be here today. That must have been so hard. So for all of our men out there, I am so compassionate and empathetic to the idea of, I can't even imagine how hard it is for a man in this world to talk about emotions um, mm -hmm. that are very deep or to have to say, you know, I'm, I'm the one being abused. Um, mm -hmm. But please know that this is way more common than you would think. You're not alone. And there are actually men's groups, just men's groups out there in all of the mental health arenas. And you can just look up like a men's group for, do for domestic violence, a men's group for suicide. Um, and those resources are out there now. So that way, because, you know, co-ed situation might be very uncomfortable. Yes. Um, and, and there are a lot of very powerful men who've come out the other side of all of this and learned to embrace their, um, their emotions and be able to express them in a really healthful, healthy way and still stay in their masculinity. Um, mm -hmm. And they run these groups and they excel at what they do. And um, we're seeing these groups a lot more in my county, in the state of New Jersey, where I live in the United States. And they've been wildly successful. Wow, awesome. Yeah. So we actually do know, um, I'm not sure whether there's any interrelated uh, or any link between anxiety, stress, and trauma, because I actually did have a lady last week sometime, we actually spoke about anxiety, stress, mm -hmm. and, and um, yeah, basically uh, emotional health. So we do know the signs if we're actually looking for something in, um, along those lines in somebody yeah. else. Is it something totally different to, um, to actually noticing the signs in someone that's actually going through it? Or is it along the same lines, similar? Well, most people that are enduring an excessive amount of trauma, there's, mm -hmm. uh, a, um, like I said, it can go one of two ways, but the mostly people withdraw. There's mm -hmm. an enormous amount of withdrawal and self-isolation. Mm -hmm. um, it could go the other way and they could become extremely extroverted. Um, mm -hmm. You might see an extreme in emotions where they could be diagnosed as like bipolar. Um, mm -hmm. But what I'm, in my experience, what I'm seeing and I feel strongly about is that a lot of these people that are being diagnosed mm -hmm. have such severe trauma that's never really been targeted. Um, no one's ever really sat them down and talked to them about their trauma and their life and where they came from and what happened. Um, validation is huge. You know, we all need to be validated. Someone whose reality has been denied, that goes very hand in hand with trauma. You know, imagine a little kid being abused and then trying to tell someone or trying to talk to the abuser and that person saying like that, th that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. I don't do that. I don't say that. You're a liar. You make up stories. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of denial of someone's reality. You'll see that a lot with narcissistic abuse. 
Um, And so most of the time there's this uh, real deep need to withdraw, to isolate. They become very antisocial, but it can be expressed in a lot of different ways. I've seen a lot of youngsters become very sexually active. Um, because that's their sense of love and validation. I need to feel loved. I want to feel approved. I want to feel validated. Mm -hmm. Um, Post-traumatic stress goes hand in hand with trauma. Think of a Vietnam vet. And so there could be um, memories, either can't, can't recall anything or cannot stop remembering. Like they literally live, they're living the trauma every single day. They just can't get away from it. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the best things I've ever done and I've ever worked through was I had a a therapist work through a, um, post-traumatic stress workbook with me. Mm -hmm. It was really deep work and you're doing it on your own. Like that was my homework in between sessions, but I'll tell you what, it was an amazing tool and I got it off of Amazon. So this was not like a fancy thing. It didn't cost me a hundred dollars. It was like a $15, $20 book off of Amazon. It was, I literally Googled post-traumatic stress disorder workbook and it came up. I saw that it was available on Amazon and we worked through it together. So I just don't want anybody walking away thinking like that the tools and the resources need to be grandiose and big and fancy. Mm -hmm. Um, These tools can be very basic and they're very accessible. But I will caution that if you're working through a workbook like that, that you are working with some kind of licensed practitioner Mm -hmm. um, because it, it, it's trauma work is heavy work. And the Mm -hmm. whole goal is to get you out of the trauma, but also just to lighten the burden of the heart, you know, because that, that heart chakra is so, so blocked.